Welcome back everyone, I'm Nick930, and to start off 2020 right, I want to share with you the complete history of one of my all-time favorite game franchises, Donkey Kong Country. Donkey Kong Country is a 2D side-scrolling platformer series, created by Rare Entertainment and published by Nintendo. The series served as a reboot of Miyamoto's classic Donkey Kong arcade games, and revolutionized the industry with its unprecedented use of digital graphics, solid gameplay mechanics, and some of the most iconic musical scores in gaming. So how exactly did a video game featuring an ape named Donkey get to be so popular? And how has the series fared over the past several decades? To answer that, we need to take it way back and begin by talking about the origin of Donkey Kong himself. Throughout the course of the 20th century, a Japanese-based playing card company called Nintendo struggled to settle on a single business venture. They were at one time a taxi company, a hotel chain, a food company, and even produced toys like the Ultra Machine and Light Gun. This Light Gun technology was especially important, as it convinced Nintendo to go all in on the emerging electronic entertainment industry. Nintendo started developing home game consoles, and even began hiring developers to work on arcade cabinet titles to help push their brand. One of those developers was a young student named Shigeru Miyamoto, who'd soon prove to be fundamental in Nintendo's success. One of Miyamoto's first challenges was to redesign the arcade cabinet game Radar Scope so that it would appeal more to Western audiences. Unlike most video games developed at the time, Miyamoto approached the design of the game by brainstorming the general theme and concepts first, with the game logic to follow afterwards. He landed on the idea of creating a sort of love triangle situation like the popular Popeye cartoons, with a hero, a villain, and a damsel in distress. This, combined with influence from the King Kong property, culminated in the idea of having a small carpenter, referred to as Jumpman, attempting to save his girlfriend Pauline from an enraged ape at the top of a construction site. When deciding on what to name the ape, Miyamoto is said to have come up with the name by looking for an English translation of the word stubborn or stupid, and landed on the word donkey. In 1981, Donkey Kong began appearing in arcades worldwide, and was a monumental hit, catapulting Nintendo into the forefront of the gaming industry. The premise of the game is simple. Players control Jumpman, who is later renamed Mario, and need to reach the top of the level without getting hit by barrels tossed down the girders by Donkey. If a player successfully makes it to the top, Donkey grabs the princess and carries her to the next level. It may seem like a straightforward concept, but these characters prove to be a marketing goldmine, giving Nintendo a proper mascot, capable of competing with the likes of Pac-Man in the arcade cabinet industry. However, not everyone was happy with Nintendo's newfound success. Universal, obviously displeased with the use of the Kong name in Nintendo's new flagship game, filed a lawsuit against the video game company claiming that they had used their intellectual property. John Kirby, Nintendo's representation, cited Universal's own argument only a few years prior, that the King Kong property was part of the public domain, and the courts ruled in favor of Nintendo, forcing Universal to provide them with a hefty 1.8 million in counterclaims and damages. This was a major win for Nintendo, as it allowed them to invest heavily in their future hardware development, and to thank Kirby, they later named another one of their mascots after him. Following the success of Donkey Kong, Nintendo created a direct sequel called Donkey Kong Jr. that flipped the script, with a new ape protagonist named Jr. that needs to climb towers to defeat an evil Mario that has trapped the original Donkey Kong in a cage. This game introduced a few new gameplay mechanics, including vines to climb on and hostile enemies like birds and crocodiles, all concepts that would likely be pulled from for future titles in the series. A year later, a third title was released, this time simply called Donkey Kong 3. This game deviates drastically from the core gameplay design, as it involves defending a greenhouse with a bug spray and forcing Donkey through the ceiling. While the latter wasn't quite as successful, both these arcade titles served to strengthen Nintendo's position in the industry, and inevitably led to the even more successful Mario spin-off series that still serves as the flagship mascot for the company today. Soon after Donkey Kong 3, the gaming industry suffered a major recession, due mostly to the excessive amount of competition and low-quality products flooding arcades and the home console market. Nintendo quietly retired the Donkey Kong IP, and turned their attention towards developing hardware like the Famicom, also known as the Nintendo Entertainment System. 
that not only revitalized the dying breed of entertainment, but introduced the world to several major game franchises. To avoid another recession from occurring, Nintendo more strictly regulated third-party software moving forward, allowing only the best software to be released for their new system. This proved to be very effective, as faith in the video game entertainment business was restored, and Nintendo dominated the scene. Moving into the early 90s, Nintendo was faced with a new challenge, a direct competitor called the Sega Genesis, that featured 16-bit graphics and a new mascot aimed to attract a younger, cooler audience. Nintendo retaliated a few years later with their own 16-bit platform, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, and turned to outside game developers to help compete against their new rival. In entered Rare, a British development studio founded by two brothers with a knack for software engineering. Rare had proven themselves to Nintendo with a highly advanced computer-animated demo of a boxing game they had developed using a pair of expensive silicone graphics processing units, the same type of technology used to create the CGI in films like Jurassic Park. Nintendo, impressed by this demonstration and eager to use it in their battle against Sega, purchased a large stake in Rare, making them the first Western development studio to serve as a second party under Nintendo. With this new partnership, the Stamper Brothers were given access to several of Nintendo's beloved properties, including the long-forgotten Donkey Kong. Development for this rebooted Donkey Kong title began in early 1993, with technical programmer Brendan Gunn, software engineer Chris Sutherland, and music composer David Wise all helping to piece the project together. Using a method rare called Advanced Computer Modeling, the developers were able to create wireframe models for every single object in the game, and then applied shaders and textures over top, along with an animation skeleton to give characters more realistic movement. These were then converted into lower resolution sprites and placed into a 2D setting. Everything from the parallax backgrounds to the UI elements were created this way, giving the game a visual appearance far ahead of anything else offered at the time. By 1994, the title was nearing completion, and was shown off at a CES trade show with a hugely positive response, proving that the SNES was still king in the market, and, in November, Nintendo released their breakaway hit, Donkey Kong Country. In Donkey Kong Country, players assume the role of Donkey Kong, the grandson of the original Donkey Kong from 1981, and his young monkey friend Diddy Kong, who is in training to become a hero. But, in the middle of the night, a horde of evil crocodiles called the Kremlings stick Diddy in a barrel and steal Donkey's beloved banana horde. After waking up and saving Diddy, the two then set off on a quest to reclaim their bananas and defeat the Kremlings that have invaded their island. Donkey Kong Country's gameplay is much different from its predecessors. While platforming and barrels remain a big part of the general aesthetic, everything about Donkey Kong Country feels fresh and unique. Players need to run, jump, climb, and swing through 40 levels, each with challenging configurations of enemies and obstacles to contend with. While not nearly as difficult as Rare's infamous Battletoads game, Donkey Kong Country still offers a formidable challenge. Some of the later levels require expert timing and patience to traverse and even challenged the player to make use of special vehicles like the infamous minecarts. Several enemies roam the jungles of Donkey Kong Island, and can often be defeated simply by jumping on their heads, but occasionally require different approaches to defeat. Some enemies, for example, can only be defeated with the much heavier Donkey, while others are easier to dodge using the much faster and more nimble Diddy. To take advantage of this, the player can press the select button to swap between the two heroes. Though, need to be careful not to take any damage, as one hit will cause the active hero to flee and get captured in another barrel. If a player takes damage with no alternate Kong to replace them, then they lose a life. Additional life balloons can be found hidden throughout the environment, alongside more common items like bananas and the letters to the name Kong. Levels are filled with these collectibles to entice players to explore more of the environment, and often point out the location of well-hidden secret bonus rooms, all of which are required to 100% the game. If you haven't already noticed from the footage shown here, the barrels previously used as obstacles in the classic Donkey Kong titles are now a fundamental part of the gameplay design for Donkey Kong Country. Players can pick up barrels to toss at enemies, and can also jump inside of them and launch through the air, often requiring precise timing to land safely. Throughout the game, the duo is supported by a few allies scattered throughout the island, including Candy Kong, that allows players to save their progress, Funky Kong, that serves as a free fast travel point, and Cranky Kong, the aged original Donkey Kong that now smacks his grandkid on the head and complains about millennials. Players can also rescue animal buddies in select levels, including Unguard the Swordfish, Rambi the Rhino, Espresso the Ostrich, Winky the Frog, and Squawks the Parrot all with unique abilities that can help the player traverse some of the more challenging sections of the game. 
The overall vibe of the game differs greatly from Nintendo's other first-party titles, with a more natural art direction and a more weighty feel to the platforming, giving Donkey Kong Country its own signature style unlike anything that had come before it. This resonated strongly with gamers, as the title sold up to 500,000 copies within the first month, an unusually high sales number for 1994. The beautiful pre-rendered 3D graphical style stood out sharply against the sea of pixelized games at the time, and proved to the world that the Super Nintendo was still the place to go for the best in console gaming. The original Donkey Kong Country has gone on to redefine Nintendo's classic arcade mascot, with its jungle environments, characters, and soundtrack still being strongly associated with the property today, and rare success prompted development to begin on a sequel shortly after. With the sequel, Rare sought to expand significantly on the core gameplay formula in the previous title. Unused concepts from before were reintroduced, and a new pirate theme was incorporated as the basis for the game's setting and characters. The sequel is built using almost exactly the same tech as before, with 3D models being converted into 2D sprites along parallax backdrops. Though, the developers were now much more familiar with the tools at their disposal, allowing for greatly expanded color and object variety, along with a more robust catalog of sound effects and gameplay mechanics. To surprise gamers, Rare decided to not make Donkey Kong a playable character, opting to make Diddy the lead character instead. In order to preserve the tag team gameplay from before, Rare worked with Miyamoto to create a new secondary protagonist, this time female, that would also allow for slightly more gameplay variety. Rather than just having two characters that control about the same, Dixie was given the ability to hover using her long ponytail. David Wise returned as the lead composer, and created several tracks based around the new pirate theme, and even reworked the final boss track from the original game as the basis for several of the new songs. In the fall of 1995, only a year after the original game, Rare released Donkey Kong Country 2 Diddy's Kong Quest. In DK Country 2, Donkey Kong is kidnapped by the angry Captain K. Rule, and Diddy and his girlfriend Dixie travel to Crocodile Isle in order to save him. While the locations of the original game were more natural and neutral, the style of the locations in DK Country 2 are more sinister and treacherous. Environments include the wrecked pirate ship from the first game, an active volcano, a swamp, a ghost-infested forest, brambles, and a secure fortress precariously perched at the top. The gameplay mechanics are expanded slightly in the sequel, with more variety and a heavier emphasis on exploration. One of the biggest changes, of course, is the addition of Dixie Kong. While Diddy handles the same, Dixie can be used to carefully hover over dangerous gaps using her ponytail, an absolute must for some of the better hidden secrets. The two Kongs can also hop on each other's backs, and be thrown over obstacles, allowing the player to access out-of-reach areas and collectibles. Bonus rooms return in DK Country 2, but are more structured, and now reward players with Kremlin coins, that can be spent at Clubba's kiosk to gain access to secret levels in the Lost World stage. Just like the first game, the only way to 100% the game is to successfully complete each and every bonus stage. Only now, this is because every single level, including the secret Lost World levels, house a rare DK coin, the total amount of which Cranky Kong will use at the end of the game to judge whether Diddy's become a true hero or not. DK Country 2 also introduces the Banana Coins, that serve as currency that can be spent at any of the Kong family establishments on the island. Characters like Funky and Cranky return in mostly the same way as before, though Candy is replaced by Wrinkly Kong, who not only allows players to save progress, but can also reveal hints about future levels. Players can also compete in a new trivia minigame, hosted by Swanky Kong, providing another opportunity to bolster up on extra lives. Like before, some levels throughout the game play host to special animal friends, that can either be ridden or controlled directly, with many unique abilities and mechanics. On guard, Rambi and Squawks return, but are accompanied by newcomers Ratley the Snake, Squitter the Spider, and a few other level-specific creatures. Enemies have also been expanded on, with new pirate-based appearances and more varied attacks, making them even more deadly. The game is designed to be far more challenging, a direct response to complaints from veteran gamers about the original title, and so things like bosses now feature more hit points and more difficult attack patterns to learn. Other changes include clearly labeled bonus barrels, new crates and chests, and a new stage endpoint that offers players a chance to earn special items if they hit the target with enough force. Everything about Donkey Kong Country 2 feels more polished and realized, with cleaner audio, smoother platforming controls, and smarter overall design. DK Country 2 was met with an overwhelmingly positive critical reception. It earned several Game of the Year rewards, and was one of the best-selling games of 1995. 
Since release, Donkey Kong Country 2 has never managed to outsell its predecessor, with total lifetime sales sitting in at around 5 million versus the original's 10 million. But the initial sales were still better than expected, and once again encouraged Rare to push on with a follow-up title only a year later. The third title to the Donkey Kong Country series went through an identical process as before, with many of the same developers returning, and Evelyn Fisher and David Wise returning to work on the soundtrack. However, by 1996, the SNES was on its last leg, as Nintendo's newer video game console, capable of true 3D graphics, was set to release in Q3 of the same year. Regardless, development on the third Donkey Kong Country continued, using the same silicone-based character renders and gameplay design. To continue their trend of mixing up the cast of lead characters, Rare dropped Diddy Kong this time, and replaced him with the heavy hitter Kitty Kong, Dixie's baby cousin. Additionally, Rare continued to expand with new creative enemy designs, more challenging platforming mechanics, and a slight increase to the RPG-like components introduced before. In November of 1996, Donkey Kong Country 3 Dixie Kong's Double Trouble was released, the final title in the series to be released on the Super Nintendo. In DK Country 3, players control Dixie Kong, who is tasked with babysitting Kitty Kong as she searches the northern hemisphere for the missing Diddy and Donkey, who have been kidnapped by an evil robot named Chaos, the supposed new leader of the Kremlins. The story offers a few more surprises than before, but is otherwise the same general principle, keeping the gameplay as the central focus of the experience. This third entry plays a lot like its predecessors, with players able to tag team it with two primates as they hop across gaps, defeat enemies, and explore the world for secret collectibles. But newcomer Kitty Kong introduces a new twist to the experience. Much like Donkey in the first game, Kitty is heavy built and can defeat larger enemies than his short, horny tailed cousin. In some rare instances, Kitty can even be used to skip across the water, which is necessary for reaching a couple of secret areas throughout the game. Dixie can still glide with her hair, but because of Kitty's larger size, the piggyback move functions a little differently. Kitty cannot be thrown a far distance, but can be used to break open weak surfaces to reveal secret paths. DK Country 3 also reworks its overall map slightly, allowing players to travel freely across a top-down map, either on foot or by means of a special vehicle created by Funky Kong. Upon defeating stage bosses, players are typically rewarded with parts to upgrade their vehicle, allowing them to travel to even more locations with their craft. Players also have a bit more freedom in how they approach the game this time, with multiple stages being available to select from. The level environments themselves are once again designed to feel more natural, with waterfalls, cliffsides, and forests making up most of the areas in the game. There are, however, also more industrial-based locations, including sawmills, factories, and sewers later on in the game, that coincide with a steady increase in difficulty. Enemies are plentiful and varied, with several redesigned types from before, along with completely new types like the Copters, Merchants, and Skidda, all requiring players to make smart use of their many abilities to overcome them. The bosses aren't quite as interesting this time around, with some pretty weak designs in some cases, though the general principle is still the same, with multiple attack patterns and easy to discover weak points that can be exploited. Most of the items introduced in DK Country 2 return, though there are a few minor changes. Kremlin coins, for example, are now simply called bonus coins, and can be spent in the Lost World to unlock additional levels. Banana coins have also been replaced with bear coins, indicating that they need to be spent at the many bear storefronts. And DK coins now require the player to defeat an enemy called Coin in each level, often requiring some smart maneuvering and puzzle solving to defeat. Animal buddies also return, though not quite in the same capacity. Animals include Squitter, Squawks, and Unguard, along with the newcomer Ellie the Elephant, who likely is a replacement for Rambi the Rhino. Ellie is one of the more interesting additions, as she can use her long trunk to suck up water and fire it back at enemies. Though she's also deathly afraid of rats, which comes into play occasionally as a unique obstacle. While not necessary to complete the main story, players also need to collect the new secret Banana Birds, that can be found in secret crystal caves hidden around the world map screen. Many of these caves need to be unlocked by interacting with the various bear family members scattered throughout the world, often requiring that players purchase special items and trade in order to gain access to more banana bird caves. Doing so will unleash the Queen Banana Bird, a step that is mandatory to receive the true ending to the story. Donkey Kong Country 3 also marks an interesting change in art direction, with a focus on returning to the more simplistic style of the first title, with no distinct theme uniting things like character designs. 
the game is gorgeous and demonstrates the full potential of this unique graphic design on the Super Nintendo platform. Overall, Donkey Kong Country 3 is another quality addition to the Donkey Kong Country series, with clever level designs, beautiful art direction, some new gameplay mechanics, and another excellent soundtrack, this time designed mostly by Evelyn Fisher, with David serving in more of a support role. The soundtrack builds upon the style introduced previously, and feels consistent all throughout. In fact, everything about Donkey Kong Country 3 is consistent with the past two titles, but its release, coinciding directly with the dawn of the new 3D-era consoles, especially the N64, doomed its initial sales right out the gate. Additionally, reviews were slightly lower than the past two titles, with many reviewers indicating that the series was losing its touch, and failed to innovate enough visually like its predecessors had done. And with that, Donkey Kong's time with the Super Nintendo was finally over, as Nintendo and Rare looked onward to the new 3D space. But before we get into that, it's worth mentioning that the Super Nintendo wasn't the only platform getting Donkey Kong titles in the mid-90s. After the initial Donkey Kong Country game released in 94, Rare was contracted to create a port of the game on the original Game Boy device. Though, because of the limited hardware and lack of color screen, the game sports a noticeably different appearance, and a lot of the level layouts, audio files, and even enemy designs had to be reworked. This resulted in Donkey Kong Land in 1995, a title that, while not as technically impressive as its SNES cousin, was still well received by fans and critics alike. As Rare continued to create the Donkey Kong Country titles, the Donkey Kong Land versions would follow soon after, with DK Land 2 releasing in the summer of 96, and the final game, DK Land 3, releasing in 97. The Donkey Kong Land series was able to coast on the success of the popularity of the franchise, with decent sales and generally positive reception, but they did little to add to the series as a whole. As we move into the early 2000s, it's important to understand that Rare was expanding significantly around this time. The large increase in funding afforded to them by Nintendo's stake purchase allowed them to greatly expand their staff, and split off into different teams to work on multiple projects simultaneously. A lot of these teams had already begun working on the leap to full 3D graphics as early as 1996. They worked on several games for Nintendo's upcoming N64, including Killer Instinct 2, Blast Core, GoldenEye 007, and Diddy Kong Racing, all of which released within the next year, and established Rare as the undisputed champion in the industry. But all the while, Rare's biggest focus was on the ambitious role-playing experience called Dream. As technology evolved, the project was reworked several times, quickly transitioning from a mature pirate-themed adventure to a 3D cartoon platformer starring side characters from Diddy Kong Racing. The result of this was Banjo-Kazooie, a prime example of an early 3D platforming video game design, with wide open spaces, colorful character mascots, and a huge emphasis on collectibles. The title was a big success, both critically and financially, and provided the groundwork for Rare's next side project. Attention then turned back to the Donkey Kong property, where Greg Mails was taking the lead on a new project. This project had started development soon after DK Country 3 had been completed, but much like Banjo-Kazooie, was forced to undergo major changes in order to adapt to the new hardware. One of the greatest challenges early on was getting Donkey and his friends to look acceptable with their new full 3D models. The original character models were used as a reference, but the outdated silicon processors proved to be useless otherwise. Everything had to be done from scratch, with brand new gameplay logic, animations, and controls. After three years of work and an unprecedented marketing campaign, Donkey Kong 64 was finally released for the N64 in 1999. While not technically a Donkey Kong Country game, DK64 retains a lot of the same characters and concepts introduced previously. Donkey, Diddy, Cranky, and even the Kremlins all make appearances, and players once again find themselves roaming a tropical island, fighting creatures, and rounding up bananas. The game's story starts off with K. Rule doing what he always does, kidnapping members of the Kong family and stealing bananas. But unlike the Super Nintendo games, DK64 doesn't restrict the player to only one or two characters. Throughout the game, players can unlock several members of the Kong family to play as, each with unique challenges and abilities. This, combined with the more open-ended environments and character progression, make DK64 a drastically different beast. While the platforming mechanics may take a bit of a backseat this time around, the game puts a greater emphasis on its combat, with more epic boss encounters and even firearms that can be purchased from Funky's armory. 
The world is built similarly to a Metroidvania title, with areas that can only be accessed after progressing far enough in the game and unlocking a particular ability. However, in order to populate these wide open spaces, Rare put an exhaustive amount of collectibles into the world, many of which are required just to progress the main storyline. It's a design that arguably hasn't aged well, considering the depth and complexity of some open world experiences available today. But in 1999, Donkey Kong 64 was hugely popular. The game received overwhelmingly positive reviews, and was praised for being the most ambitious title on the N64 to date. However, despite DK64's success, Rare's time with the Donkey Kong property would soon come to an end. Throughout the late 90s and early 2000s, Rare continued to work on projects for the N64, including a few Disney-themed racing games and a new family-friendly platformer featuring a squirrel named Conker. This Conker spin-off eventually transitioned into being a much more inappropriate game than its cartoon characters would suggest. Nintendo, not pleased with the direction Rare had taken, refused to promote or publish the game, forcing Rare to have THQ publish it instead. As work begun on another Donkey Kong spin-off racing game, Rare ran into some financial roadblocks. The next generation of console hardware was already around the corner, and the cost for software development had increased far beyond what Nintendo's original stake had offered them. Nintendo, no longer relying on Rare to help sell their hardware, refused to buy out the rest of their stake, forcing the British studio to finally part ways and seek out a new publisher. In 2002, Rare found a new home, and became one of Microsoft's earliest first-party studios for the new Xbox. And while Rare were able to hold on to the rights for Banjo-Kazooie and Conker, they were forced to abandon the Donkey Kong property for good. After the Rare Exodus, the Donkey Kong franchise entered an awkward transitionary era. Nintendo at this point had turned their focus towards their other successful IPs, like Mario and Zelda, and decided to outsource future Donkey Kong video games to third-party developers. One of these developers was Bandai Namco, that created a line of rhythm-based Donkey Kong games called Donkey Konga, all of which required a special Bongo peripheral controller to play on the Nintendo GameCube. These games were the start of what would become a peripheral-based rhythm game obsession in the mid to late 2000s. And with the Donkey Kong brand attached to it, the Donkey Konga series managed to sell well, especially in Japan. In 2004, an internal development studio at Nintendo created a new Donkey Kong platforming game built to take advantage of the Bongo controller. This game, titled Donkey Kong Jungle Beat, was a small step in the right direction, Though, in order to properly incorporate the limited controls of the drum peripheral, the gameplay is built more heavily around scoring style combos, as opposed to conquering challenging levels. Jungle Beat does away with a lot of the classic DK characters and gameplay mechanics that fans have come to expect from the series, but a lot of its new design elements were later incorporated into the even more popular Super Mario Galaxy games, continuing the unique collaborative relationship between the two franchises. DK also continued to build its presence on handheld devices, with remakes of the original Donkey Kong Country titles being released for the Game Boy Advance, each with several tweaks to the visuals and gameplay. Unlike the DK Land games, the Game Boy Advance versions feature full color, along with improved audio and mostly the same level layouts as the original SNES titles. In 2004, Nintendo hired a small studio called Payon to make Donkey Kong games. Their first project was a Game Boy Advance game called DK King of Swing, where players swing around pegs, collecting bananas, and defeating enemies. This game was received decently enough due to its solid puzzle and gameplay design, but was also criticized for its deviation from Rare's artistic style. Payon responded with a sequel two years later called DK Jungle Climber, that improved on the visuals with the help of the newer Nintendo DS platform. This game fared slightly better, with many praising its gameplay and visuals, though still failed to deliver the same type of immersive experience that fans have been clamoring for. In the same year, Pan released their first and last console Donkey Kong game, titled Donkey Kong Barrel Blast. Barrel Blast is a sort of kart racing game that features Donkey Kong Country characters flying with the use of barrel-based jetpacks. This game was initially planned to release on the GameCube and make use of the Bongo peripheral controllers, but was eventually delayed and released on the Nintendo Wii instead. It received abysmal scores, with many citing its slow pace and outdated graphics, and as it stands is one of the lowest rated main console titles in the Donkey Kong series. 
Miyamoto, concerned for the well-being of one of his earliest creations, began to inquire internally on which studio would be the best fit to carry on the property, and one of his producers recommended the creators of the Metroid Prime games, Retro Studios. Having just suffered a major fallout of developers at the end of Metroid Prime 3's development, Retro Studios was composed mostly of fresh faces, many of whom were eager to work on the Donkey Kong property when they heard the news. Many of these members had grown up with the original Rareware titles, and were passionate about the classic 2D platforming style that had breathed life into the series during the 90s. In the spring of 2008, development began on the reboot title using a reworked game engine from their last Metroid project. Initial development was focused on rewriting the tools to make them function with the new style of game, with the ultimate goal of invoking nostalgia with its familiar visuals and gameplay mechanics, while also giving gamers something new to experience. Additionally, a big focus with the development of this reboot project was ensuring that the game appealed both to old-school fans and newcomers alike. The original series of DK Country games were brutally difficult by the standards of the late 2000s. Though, the developers recognized that this was something that fans were greatly anticipating. So, rather than just choosing one side, they incorporated mechanics similar to New Super Mario Bros., like the Super Guide, that would assist players struggling to pass certain level sections. Players were also given an extra hit point, and a new simultaneous multiplayer feature was incorporated to let players tackle the game together. By 2010, Retro was still struggling to nail down the general feel of the gameplay, and still had about 70 stages left to create. But it wasn't until after receiving the glowing fan response to their E3 demo that they were able to right the ship. Using the level Poppin' Planks as their benchmark, they were able to rapidly construct the rest of the stages, and the final product, named Donkey Kong Country Returns, released for the Nintendo Wii in November of 2010. DK Country Returns takes place on Donkey Kong Island, where a violent volcanic eruption reveals an ancient enemy called the Tic Tac Tribe. These floating tiki heads immediately begin to hypnotize the wildlife on the island, convincing them to round up all the bananas that are necessary to expand their army. Donkey, unsurprisingly displeased with this, sets off once again to recover his bananas and punish those responsible. DK Country Returns, as the title clearly suggests, returns to its classic gameplay roots, with a 2D platforming design synonymous with Rare's formula. However, the movement and controls are handled very differently. While walking, running, and jumping all handle as you'd expect, the rolling control, necessary to make long jumps and maintain consistent speed, is managed by physically shaking the Wiimote controllers. Contrary to what you might think, this mechanic feels surprisingly natural, and does successfully make the experience a bit more immersive, though it is disappointing that the game offers no alternate control option for players unwilling to shake their arms throughout the course of its 10 hour average runtime. Other changes include a rework of the classic tag team gameplay. In DK Returns, players take control of Donkey Kong exclusively throughout the game. Diddy can still be rescued from DK barrels, though he serves more as an additional buff to the player, and can assist Donkey across large gaps with the use of his barrel jetpack. Diddy is playable, however, in the optional two-player co-op mode. As I mentioned previously, DK Returns features additional hit points for characters, represented by hearts in the corner of the screen. This would seemingly suggest that the gameplay is easier, but DK Returns still offers a significant challenge to players. Sure, you'll never run into any game over screens, as extra lives are rewarded so frequently that they feel pointless, but there are several platforming sections throughout the game that feel even more difficult than the original games. These are made even more challenging with the addition of the reworked collectibles. Players can still collect bananas to earn extra lives, but the Kong letters are now a requirement in order to gain access to brutally difficult secret levels. Additionally, players now need to find well-hidden puzzle pieces, often obscured behind clever environmental curtains that reveal themselves upon discovery. Puzzle pieces are also awarded in bonus stages that, due to time constraints, have been simplified a great deal, with roughly 10 templates that are constantly reused throughout the course of the game. Returns introduces a few new gameplay mechanics, including the ability to pound on the ground, necessary for stunning enemies or accessing secret rooms, and the ability to crouch down and blow on things like pinwheels and dandelions. But the most interesting new ability is the new Grassy Wall Cling, that adds some interesting new verticality to the platforming, and even plays a fundamental role in several of the challenging boss fights. Animal buddies also make a return, though also seem to have been simplified. The only rideable animal in the game is Rambi, who appears only a handful of times. Squawks also makes a return, but now functions as a purchasable item from Cranky's storefront, 
and squawks when the player is close to a hidden puzzle piece. While DK Returns may seem like a lackluster return to form due to its removal of features established with Rare's games, the actual platform mechanics are surprisingly some of the very best in the series. Levels are incredibly inventive, with perfectly crafted obstacles and unique concepts. The pacing is also much faster, as players can waggle their Wiimotes and dash across stages at record speeds, emphasized further by the new time trial mode. Minecart levels also make a return in a big way, along with a new level style based around navigating an unstable barrel rocket through an auto-scrolling obstacle course. It's a refreshing platformer game, with a solid difficulty curve that aims to challenge veterans with its lofty 100% goal, while also being forgiving enough for newcomers to break into the series. The visual direction for this reboot is nothing short of remarkable. Despite its 2D perspective, Returns features beautiful, full-rendered environments, with tons of impressive set pieces that help to make the worlds feel more alive. The parallax backgrounds of the original game likely inspired Retro to build worlds with plenty of depth, and incorporated tons of moving pieces in both the background and foreground. To go along with this beautiful visual style, the soundtrack also marked a return to form, with tracks inspired heavily by David Wise and Evelyn Fisher. Retro's artistic style and solid gameplay mechanics marked the start of a new era for the Donkey Kong series, and one that resonated strongly with fans. The game was met with a positive response from critics, and was praised as one of the best platformer games of 2010, with many applauding its challenging design and beautiful art direction. However, many complained about the game's lack of a secondary control option, and found the waggle roll design to be excessive. Others faulted the game for abandoning concepts found in the original SNES titles, including a lack of the Kremlin enemies, animal buddies, and underwater levels. Still, despite those concerns, DK Country Returns was massively successful, earning multiple awards, and has gone on to become the second best-selling Donkey Kong Country game of all time, with upwards of 6.5 million units sold. Donkey Kong Country had truly returned, and Retro, still passionate about the project, pushed for a sequel to be made only a few years later. Almost immediately after DK Country Returns had wrapped up, Retro Studios were eager to begin on an immediate follow-up, and with Nintendo's newest Wii U console set to release in only two years, they saw it as the perfect opportunity to expand on their formula. Several concepts that were planned for their previous project, including underwater gameplay, were brought back into the fold, and veteran composer David Wise joined the team once again contributing his musical talents to the game's soundtrack. Retro also attempted to address complaints from veteran DK Country players by bringing back Dixie Kong as an alternate to the Diddy Kong player buff, along with a few other surprises. At E3 2013, Nintendo announced Retro's new Donkey Kong project, with the proposed Holiday 2013 release. However, in order to improve on a few technical issues, the game was pushed back a few months, and in February of 2014, Retro released Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, the most recent mainline entry to the Donkey Kong Country franchise. In Tropical Freeze, Donkey Kong is celebrating his birthday with a large banana cake, a reference to the franchise's 30th anniversary, but is interrupted by an invasion of northern Viking invaders, who freeze over Donkey Kong Island and perch their ship at the top of the volcano. Donkey and his friends are then forced to island hop their way back home and defeat the unwelcome visitors. Tropical Freeze represents the perfect marriage of all the gameplay designs and concepts learned over the course of the past 30 years. Thanks to the new Wii U platform, players are no longer forced to waggle a motion controller to maintain momentum, and the focus is instead put into more dynamic environments and clever platforming designs. The awkward blowing mechanic from DK Returns was removed, likely because of how much it slowed down the pace of the gameplay. But in its place, Tropical Freeze incorporates a new plucking mechanic that lets players grab and pull items out of the ground, often triggering new environmental events. This mechanic is inspired directly by the plucking gameplay of Super Mario Bros. 2, which is unsurprising considering Kensuke Tanabe helped to produce the game. The game's DK barrels have also been reworked, and now allow players to choose between Diddy, who uses the same jetpack as before, Dixie, who can use her ponytail to give Donkey a vertical boost, and, for the first time, a playable Cranky Kong that lets players hop around on his cane like a pogo stick, much like the classic DuckTales video game. Tropical Freeze also reintroduces underwater gameplay, a hallmark of the Donkey Kong Country franchise. But unlike past games, players now need to carefully monitor their breath displayed next to the health bar, and refill their oxygen by popping air bubbles released at checkpoints throughout the stage. Players can also spin attack to defeat weaker enemies, and can make use of the currently equipped Kong Buddy to utilize additional abilities. 
The game's bonus stages offer some new layouts, but are disappointingly still very repetitive, and the animal buddies are still limited to just Rambi the Rhino and Squawks in a support role. But just as before, these downsides are overshadowed by the brilliant platforming design in each of the game's stages. Environments offered are some of the most unique in the series, with a new African savanna, a colorful underwater cove, an Oktoberfest-style village, and even a frozen-over version of Donkey Kong Island, complete with references to the past adventure. It's an ambitious title, with much longer, more expansive level designs, and significantly more enemy variety than before. The Tikis have been replaced with new Arctic and Antarctic-based animals like penguins, walruses, seals, and polar bears along with a few other stage-specific creatures. It's a definite return to form for the series, even more so than the previous title, and the return of David Wise's beautifully inventive musical scores, along with a bump to a 720p resolution, makes Tropical Freeze one of the strongest entries in the series. And audiences seem to agree, as the game has received overwhelmingly positive reviews, with many outlets praising the game for its improved gameplay variety and beautiful art style. But despite its positive reception, Tropical Freeze sold 80% less than its counterpart. This is due strongly in part to the Wii U's poor sales numbers, a problem rectified with Nintendo's most recent console platform, the Nintendo Switch. Four years after the Wii U release, Retro Studios released a Switch remaster of Tropical Freeze that includes a few new features, including a new funky mode, aimed to provide a more forgiving experience for less experienced players. Thanks to the Switch's more successful sales numbers, Tropical Freeze on the Switch managed to outsell its original Wii U counterpart, giving audiences a proper chance to experience its solid platforming design. The Donkey Kong series is arguably one of the most important video game franchises of all time. The original game not only helped to establish Nintendo as we know it today, but also helped to jumpstart the platforming genre. The series only continued to build upon its own legacy, with the introduction of the Donkey Kong Country series that revolutionized the industry once again by pushing the boundaries of what was possible at the time with graphical design. And while the series may have lost some ground throughout the course of the 2000s, it has since clambered back into the spotlight and continues to deliver some of the very best platforming in the video game market. At this point, it's unclear where the series will go next. It's quite possible a third entry to the Donkey Kong Country reboot is in a pre-development phase. Though, with the recent delay in reallocation of Retro Studios to work on Metroid Prime 4, it's possible Nintendo may also seek to put a new studio in charge of the property. But we'll just have to wait and see where Nintendo plans on taking this classic tie-wearing ape next. But what do you think? Where do you think the Donkey Kong series should go next? And which Donkey Kong titles were your favorite? Let me know in the comments section. If you want to see more documentaries like this one, please consider becoming a member of my Patreon. With your support, I can freely explore topics that you guys want me to cover. You'll get early access to new videos, behind-the-scenes content, and access to a private Discord to discuss upcoming releases. I also wanted to give a special shout-out to Kung Fu Hot Dog for being a Gold Member patron. Your support is greatly appreciated. And of course, if you want to continue to see new documentaries, comparisons, and reviews, don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos posted every week.